Good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Washam with Northwest Missouri State University here in Kansas City. I'm also a member of the Northland Education and Business Alliance, or as we call it, NEBA. NEBA is a network of education and business organizations in Clay and Platte counties whose vision is to promote and provide a business-driven educational opportunities for you, our next generation of business leaders. I'll be hosting the session today, but wanted to give a shout out to another NEPA member that is working with us. Um, her name is Courtney Reyes, and she is with the Kansas City Home Builders Association, and she will be moderating our questions from the audience today. So feel free to post your questions to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation, and we'll work those into our conversation. This session will run for 40 minutes with a hard stop at 40 minutes after nine o'clock. Our industry experts will begin by sharing their professional history and insight, but again, please feel free to post questions to us throughout. Um, we also wanted to let you know that when the session ends, you'll be asked to take a very brief survey. Please give us your feedback so that we can make this event and future events better for you, our participants. And last but not least, this session will be recorded and available on NEVA's YouTube channel um, in, in the very near future for you to use as you need to do so. So let's get started today. Um, I, we are very excited to host um, a couple of very knowledgeable technical experts um, in our session. And so I will have Damon go first. Could you please um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Hi, my name is Damian Boley. I am a uh, director of technology at a company you've probably never heard of, but use often. It's called Income Payments. We own Visa, MasterCard, American Express gift cards, uh, and process dozens of other uh, brands. Uh, if you buy a gift card at Walmart, we probably touch it at some point. Um, I've had a very interesting career in, in IT. Uh, I'm a non-traditional student and uh, was hired right after my first semester of college at Sprint. And it took me till I was 30 to finish my degree. And then I got my master's 19 months later. Uh, but I've always sucked to the IT field, either as uh, working for a big corporate or for a startup. Um, so I've touched just about anything and everything. And I'm a serial entrepreneur. I own a few businesses and have been involved in uh, early adoption of technology throughout my career. Thank you. John, could you give us a little bit more information about yourself? So my name is John Hardwick. I'm the president and owner of a company called Nexio. We provide complete outsourced IT services to businesses around the metro. Um, graduated from high school in 99, did the traditional going to DeVry learning programming um, degree, and um, worked four years at a startup here in KC and ended up starting my own business at that point. So 17 years later, that's me. Wonderful, thank you. So Damien, can you tell us what does a normal day look like for you? Uh, it's very difficult to say because as you know, I have many jobs. Um, and so typically my day starts out at 7.30 with a call with my team. Uh, most of my team is located in Atlanta. Um, I've pretty much worked remote most of the last two decades. Uh, it's been very rare that I was actually in an office so when the pandemic started, it was kind of uh, same old, same old for me. Um, and my day usually goes until about 10 o'clock at night, depending on if we're doing deployments or not. Uh, but every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm on at 730 with my boss and my uh, peers for a 15 minute stand up. And then throughout the day, it's a few different meetings um, and balancing that with running businesses and being the mayor of this fine city that I live in. So um, a few things going on, but. Yeah, they're just a few things. <laughs> You're yeah. not putting more hours than I am for sure. <laughs> um, so John, could you tell us what a typical day looks like for you? So because we're providing outsourced IT to these different businesses, we're doing a little bit of everything different every day. Um, so, I've got a staff of five that are kind of handling initial phone call triage stuff. Um, so a user calls in or submits a ticket and says, hey, I've got a problem with Word or my Outlook doesn't work or half the time it's I forgot my password. Um, my guys are working through those. 
um, and then escalating as necessary. So um, that's on the support side of the house, but then at the same point we're doing, hey, I've opened a new office or a new location, or I'm starting a new business and I don't know where to start. And we're doing everything from um, setting up the server and the licensing and getting the internet to doing the cabling work to, to doing all of the, the full, full summit, or I guess the full set of, of business services. So the cool thing about it is I hire people is I can tell them legitly, you're not going to have two days that are the same. Um, but I know there's some people that really like that structure. So it's kind of a, a different thing in the environment. That true entrepreneurial spirit of do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. It Very is. It's a totally, it's a totally different experience. Very cool. So whenever we think about like essential or transferable skills um, that make young people successful in their careers, um, Damien, what would you advise that um, students could focus on in those transferable skills to um, help them in their future careers? So <clears throat> the number one thing that I usually look for, um, and I've hired a lot of people in my career. I, I worked for h &R Block and that was the number one thing we did is hire and, and fire people because uh, we had a lot of seasonal staff there and, and train people. And I always look for somebody that can figure out uh, or at least knows the steps in problem solving. Um, I've had recruiters that I've worked with that have worked with other IT directors and they only want somebody that's got a degree or they only want somebody that's got a master's and five years of experience. Um, I've told, I've flat out told my recruiters, I take somebody working at Burger King if they have put together a portfolio of really cool stuff they built on the side learning YouTube because not everybody is fortunate enough to go to school and some people just go straight into the workforce. And I respect that, but the problem solving ability is Number one with my my team, uh, you have to try to at least figure it out and, and then ask for help when you know you can't figure it out. Very good. John, what do you it, think about it, those essential skills that are definitely needed? I, I think to echo Damon, um, I, what we see a lot is people that come in that have had, hey, I was a plumber yesterday, or I'm new to the field, and I, I want to be an IT guy. And there's a lot of people in the industry that are pushing certification, certification, certification. And while I can say there's value in certifications, and I can say there's a lot more value in a person that has a natural desire to do it. Um, and you can tell the people that have went through those programs and come out with, like, have, have played, tinkered, explored on their own, and have taken that additional step of doing a little bit more research, and a little bit more exploring into the field. Um, the A plus certification has kind of been an industry staple forever. And the big focus on that is troubleshooting and, and just problem solving, you know, like, hey, their internet's out. And these guys immediately go with call the internet provider versus, hey, do they have power? Is there any lights on it? Like, I mean, it, you can tell when you interview a person and they jump straight to the end where you're going to be with troubleshooting. And that applies to so many different aspects of the job and understanding how those pieces work together. But, you know, to side tangent a little bit, that's the biggest thing that we see when we interview people is we'll see people that come in and say like, hey, I built a computer. And that's the only thing on their resume that has anything to do with tech. And they're like, hey, I want to be this great I, I want to be this great computer guy. And I'm like, so what else do you do in your hobbies? What else, you know, give me more than I built a computer for my friend once and that makes me a computer guy. Um, and those are the people that stand out when we're doing interviews. Yeah, and to echo what John just said, um, I worked the help desk at um, h and Block for a little while and we actually had an office call me one time and this call has stuck in my brain for now at least 10 years. Um, we started down the traditional troubleshooting path of, hey, my computer's not turning on. And I said, okay, can you uh, make sure that the that it's plugged in? And they said, well, let me get a flashlight. And I said, why do you need a flashlight? And they said, our power's out. Well, they didn't realize that that caused their computer to turn off too. So sometimes it's those simple, quick questions that you can help solve that problem. So it sounds like some communication skills would be good too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Digging deeper, listening to the things that aren't being said, maybe. <laughs> yep, yep. Fabulous. Um, want to remind our attendees this morning, we do have the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to post questions to us, and we'll work those into the conversation as we speak to our technology experts. Um, 
Now, you've also kind of touched on education, educational background, and experiences. Um, if someone were to want to pursue something beyond high school diploma um, that would help them kind of move into um, your field, what would be like one or two um, educational paths that you would recommend? So, so it's funny, John mentioned he graduated in 99. That's the same year I graduated. Um, at that time, I, I was in a small town high school and we were fortunate enough that our uh, teachers had went out and got grants to allow us to have fiber to our school, uh, computers in all the classrooms. Um, we built the website for the school because at the time teachers did not know how to do that and manage content. Um, we had email, we had different things. And so when I originally was looking at career path and college and things like that, I was looking at those traditional careers of, I'm gonna go be pre-law and get a, a business degree and work in, you know, work in corporate law or something along that field but it wasn't really until you started seeing computers grow up around us as we were growing up and that this could really be a job and i'm sure when and john started uh there were still guys wearing ties to work because that's what it guys had to do but uh in especially in john's field you get ties stuck in a printer once and you don't do that anymore um so we've kind of grown up with technology around us so it, we've had to be uh, flexible and you know certifications really got pushed hard and they're starting to get pushed hard again um, getting those basic core uh, like you said communication skills email skills um, I've actually helped coach people out of our jobs that their emails were like tweets uh, we've got this new generation that, that treats email as, as twitter um, but they're there's no direct career path into IT that I've ever seen. Um, I used to hire people in Ireland. Uh, we had an office there. And in Ireland, they start their career paths when they're in middle school. And they don't change jobs like we do here in America. We're fortunate enough that we uh, have that ability to move around. But when I was in high school, there was a class that was called English for Dummies. And I took it because I, I was in the gifted program, but I didn't want to take classical English and all this other, you know, writing literature. Um, I wanted to learn how to write a resume and write an email. And those skills are very, very important. So taking word classes, uh, Microsoft Office, um, learning how to compose a, an email that gets your point across to people, because you get so many miscommunications when you send a quick email or a text or now that we have teams, right, your tone could be taken very wrongly in, in an instant message program very easily because you've got to understand in the workforce right now, we have a, there's generations ahead of me and generations behind me. And I grew up with the technology, but those generations ahead of me did not. So, you know, getting teams was new to them. Getting uh, text messaging was new to them. Some of you have probably always had a phone. And. John and I grew up having to pick up a phone off the wall to call people in a short period of time. So I think that's the, you know, you talk about that. Most of our correspondence with clients is via ticketing and written communication. And I'll see uh, a guy that will have a 15 minute phone call and the notes on what happened during that call will be either three words or there'll be like a run on paragraph with all lowercase, no punctuation to echo. It's, it's the texting instant messaging mindset of, of how the generations are communicating um, and, and understanding kind of how that affects the older generation as much as everybody wants to say, hey, I'm me and I'm individualized. And to his point about the suit and tie and that type of stuff, you know, I started this company at 21 and had a company of $200,000 by the time I was 22 and, and sitting here, you know, talking to those individuals, there's an expectation when you're talking to that, that older individual of, you know, Hey, you're doing the polo, you know, there's, there's a credibility that comes with your appearance. Um, but there's also a credibility that comes with your ability to communicate. Um, and, and I think, you know, as far as getting into the field, um, I, I think it's that natural, in my case, it's that natural desire. Um, I've, I've had people that are interview that says, Hey, I had, you know, I did the, the military route and I had the GI bill and it gave me this, this option to get, get subsidized education. 
And so I heard this radio ad and I figured, why not do IT? And so I went and did IT and this guy's telling me this during the interview. And I'm like, you know, I want somebody that wants to do IT because they want to do IT. Um, I, there's a big push on the education side, unfortunately, of, hey, get into IT because that's where the money's at. I, those, the difference in the person that wants to do it versus the person that doesn't comes back in, in the interview and it comes back in, in the quality of the ultimate employee. So if you're interested in the field, find ways to get involved. There's, I know there's like the robotics groups. I mean, some of the, some of the most interesting people that I've hired haven't been directly in IT, but they've had that natural analytical, like I want to do problem solving. I want to do those types of things that have turned into some of the best employees. Yeah. And along that same line, my, uh, my sister-in-law, she's always been looking for the career that fits her. And I told her years ago and, and paid for a class for her to do project management. I said, I think you'd be a good project manager. And in IT, uh, we have project managers, business analysts, all kinds of jobs that are not necessarily technical. And she went to, she decided uh, I'm going to go, she's going to go to Centric. She's going to learn how to be a de .NET developer and she's going to do that path. And four years later, she's a business analyst because uh, she writing code, she, she could figure out how to do it. She could, but it wasn't her wheelhouse of dealing with the, the peers and different things in coding because um, developers are a unique bunch. And um, sometimes it, it, with her personality, a uh, business analyst, project manager was a better fit. So there are a lot of careers in IT outside of, uh, you know, putting six RAM in a computer and uh, launching cloud servers also. So there, well, there's a lot of different paths. And that's where, I mean, my degree was in programming. I mean, it was seven programming languages in three years. And it was, you know, and, and it was during my time I was, I was doing the college life and, you know, I would do class for half a day and then I would go to work and work was more of like server administration and, and remote desktop and internet connections and routers and those types of things. And I got to see both sides of the field at the same time and decided, you know, I, I've looked at life totally differently after going through programming degrees because it, it forces you down the road of like thinking logically and how does this correlate and how does this correlate? Um, but, you know, I learned that I didn't want to live in a cube. I, you know, I like being able to do programming and to do that problem solving, but there's a hundred other ways in the same general field where you can accomplish that same, same goal. Um, and, and I think that's the one comment I will say is if you are interested in programming and stuff, the one piece that I, I regret from trying to teach myself new languages and stuff as they come out is that formalized structure that comes with being in a classroom environment. Um, when they're teaching you how to say hello world in this language and how to loop through and, you know, total up these seven items and those types of things. Um, later in life, when you're teaching yourself stuff, you'll never force yourself to go through the basics. Um, and as a result, you end up walking away with, hey, I learned 70% of this kind of bobbled together um, that, that is never the same as if you had went through formal training. Yeah, there's a method of the madness in the classroom, right? It's, it might seem very mind-numbing at the beginning, but it is necessary to take those steps um, to get to where you need to go. Thanks, guys. We do have a question from the audience. Um, it says, when in high school would getting an internship in the tech field be helpful in getting my foot in the door of an IT company? And anyone can take that question first. I mean, there's been times um, where we've looked for interns and haven't had as far as, because um, we're in a late that we haven't had the best best ability to find a good intern source in the area um, and also to find a way on our side that we can make that that project work or something that's going to be an entertaining and informative for an intern not just hey reset passwords for the rest of your life um, but but to give you some real exposure to the different stuff so i i think if you have the opportunity to do it um you know he mentioned in high school and working with the school um i mean I ended up working, I grew up in a small town in central Missouri. Um, we had a really tech centric district at 90 in 99, but I was able to work for the district doing computer imaging and stuff over the summer and, and, and got a lot of exposure. At that point, we were an Apple school district. So I was doing um, Apple hardware replacement and ended up being like an Apple certified hardware guy at, you know, 18. 
Um, and it was, it was some things that, that has carried with me for, for then on. Um, it is, it's getting your foot in the door, um, in any way you possibly can. Um, you know, he mentioned working at H&R Block. That's kind of a staple around Kansas City um, when you get to that point in life of doing their telephone tech support. Um, you know, they're, they're a foundational employer in the city where, you know, it gives you experience to working with customer service and typing ticket notes and, you know, any way you can get in the field, some of them are not going to be the most glamorous. They're not going to be the most well-paying jobs. Um, but there, there are any way you can get into the field and show that desire is going to look better on a resume than, than somebody that can't have any experience or doesn't have any experience at all. And I know there's that, that, that catch 22 of, Hey, I want to get in the field, but nobody will let me in, um, because I don't have experience. That's where it's, it's showing the desire to do something in the field. Um, even if it's extracurricular stuff or project work or things on the side that you're not getting paid for. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. Uh, don't have the expectation that you're going to get paid. I guarantee your school district is short staffed in IT. Volunteer to help uh, your IT folks at, at the school. And just be around IT companies. Even if it's you, you come in and say, hey, I want to uh, help take out the trash during the day. And, you know, I want to just be in the office and whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. Uh, I've gotten pushback from different folks in, in my career that, um, you're a director, you shouldn't do that. Or even at city hall, you're the mayor, you shouldn't do that. I I'm willing to do any job that I'm going to ask somebody else to do. And if, if you're not there to take out the trash for me, I have to take it out myself. And the same thing at any startup out there, somebody is going to have to help, you know, put up the security cameras, or if you can't hire a company like John's plug in computers for people, add a second monitor. Um, these things that might seem simple to you are not always simple in any kind of um, government agency out there, any type of school, they're always going to have a need for extra work. And if you're just there to help and be a second pair of hands, even if it's carrying the box of cable for the guy to go run a cable, those jobs are very, very valuable and they're necessary because it's, you're going to be in the career. You're going to learn, you're going to learn something. You're going to pick something up and you might learn that it's not for you. I mean, I used to crawl through crawl spaces and install Wi-Fi in hotels. It's not glamorous, but I guarantee you, you've used Wi-Fi in a hotel and somebody had to install it. So there's a ton of opportunities there. It just don't have an attitude and, and show up and work. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, another couple of questions that came in are, uh, what is the average pay or starting pay? And I assume they're probably looking for entry level. Uh, since the pandemic started, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, when I started working at 16, I made 415 an hour. Uh, when I started at h &R Block at the help desk, I think I made around $14 an hour. I think that might be generous even. Um, and then I just had a DevOps position open that was over 100,000, but that's uh, you know quite a bit of experience in things. Um, it's a pretty wide range, uh, but if you're going to be an intern, expect to not get paid. Um, we we start, and he mentioned things have changed a little bit with with COVID. Um, I guess to touch on that, one thing I will say is is understand where your pay is and where that's getting you into the field, um, because you know we're seeing people for what would have been a sixteen dollar an hour job that are expecting eighteen now. Um, just over the last two years. Um, so, you know, at some point that bubble is probably going to burst. Um, but I, I think, I guess my point behind that is um, working a day in an MSP, you're going to see 50 different technologies. You're going to see, you're going to get, and, and Reddit will back this up there as an industry, we're probably like drinking from a fire hose. If, if you want to do it, it's the best way to learn the field there's some people that will get burnt out very quickly. Um, and then there's some people that come in and say, hey, I should be making blah because I read on some forum that Cisco guys make blah. Um, I, I think you need to take into the whole compensation thing, the idea of where you're learning and learning on the job. Um, with that said, um, we're starting $17 an hour help desk positions now. Um, 
and and working it up to 23 to 25, kind of depending on where that experience is. Um, and and it's based on, again, that desire to learn and, and certifications and some of those types of things. Of, but again, I'm one that's very quick to say those certifications are backing knowledge that you should already have. They're not, hey, I passed this test, therefore I have more value. Um, so again, there's a thousand ways in the industry to make it through certification tests and come out knowing nothing more than when you started. Um, don't fall down that rabbit hole because it becomes apparent to the employers and totally defeats the value of the, the cert to begin with. Wonderful. Okay. And then the question is kind of along the same lines, but a little bit different. So I separated it as well is what is the best paying job in IT? <laughs> uh, I yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna and, I mean, as an industry, the argument would probably be that that security is where it is. Um, I, you know, you see you see a lot of, of movement in that space right now um, and security analysts, those types of deals. Um, on our side, it turns into more of like these project guys um, that are able to do implementations and, and kind of be independent. And essentially they, they fully run, you know, I saw earlier about somebody gets a new office and does that type of stuff. They're managing that project, but they're doing everything on the technical side as well. Um, and, you know, that kind of comes with, you know, the more money comes with nights, weekends, some of that extra type of work. Um, but it really becomes essentially you're running IT for four or five companies at a time. So the reason I laugh is it, the pay is relative. Uh, you got to look at the, the, the entire your what you want your life to look like. I've slept with a cell phone next to me for 22 years. I get paid well, but part of that time, I had no work-life balance. Um, and again, like I said, I, I start my day at seven o'clock and, and end it usually 10, 11 o'clock at night on, on some days. Um, but you could get a $40,000, $50,000 a year job where at the end of the day, you clock out and get to go home and not worry about that job until you come back to work. It's, it's very relative to what you want your life to look like. Yeah, you can make $300,000 a year being a security analyst for Facebook, but as soon as something screws up, you're fired. If you break the build at Facebook, you're fired. There are no questions asked. You break the build, you're fired. Do you want to live under that stress or do you want to be able to clock out at the end of the day and go home? So it's relative to what you want to do. And being, a, being an entrepreneur like myself and John, who have been able to be part of startups, he's lived it. He knows it. He did it at the same kind of age I did. I started a Wi-Fi startup. Uh, in 2002, when people told me I was crazy that nobody had ever used internet from a hotel or conference center and uh, iPhones didn't exist then. So why would you do this craziness where you plug a card into your laptop to be able to use the internet? Um, we've been part of that and we've lived that and it's still continuing to change. And yes, you can go make a huge amount of money working for Google or Facebook or one of these companies out in the Valley, but you could also pay $8,000 a month for apartment rent that you're living in two other guys with, because that's what's available. So living in the Midwest, we have the benefit of affordable housing, good schools, uh, a, a good work-life balance in most of our jobs. Um, but yeah, security is super high pay. Uh, developers are very well compensated, but you literally live staring at a screen. And I think, you know, to that point, I mean, entrepreneurism as a whole turns into a, you're essentially on call 24 seven, one way or the other. Um, but I, I think there is, um, there are a lot of positions in the space where you can still accomplish that work-life balance, um, to his point, but it, it also kind of depends on where you are in the realm. And as, as I was saying earlier, you know, entry into the field, you're going to get, unfortunately, you're going to get a lot of the, the less desirable positions. You're going to get the, Hey, you're triaging, you know, you're dealing with password resets for half your day. Um, but you're building experience to learn into other things. Um, and there's, there's a lot of employers in town where it, that's not a structured migration. So like in my guy's case, they're like, hey, I got 20 calls about this and their free time, they're doing more research into that. And then you know, they're eventually becoming, hey, I'm the firewall guy 
or I'm the wireless guy, or, you know, people, people can kind of delve into those, those different pieces, use anything you can to get your foot in the door to get these jobs and, and be dedicated to them. That will get you more experience in the field. And that will get you over that resume hurdle of, I don't have any experience, but I have all this schooling. Yeah. When I, when I started H&R Block, it was that position you had mentioned earlier, you know, the help desk job at H&R Block in, in Kansas City is very popular. I had sold my company. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, said, I need you to get out of the house and go get a job. Um, so I said, I'll just go be a help desk somewhere. That'll be super easy. And uh, I can leave at the end of the day. And in my nine-year career at H&R Block, I ended up being the uh, director of global technology that was going to be living in Ireland and had been commuting back and forth uh, from Dublin, Ireland and Salt Lake City and all these different places where we had technology centers. So like I said, just get in the door and then figure out where you want to go is sometimes a good place to do to a company like H&R Block or Sprint or T-Mobile now, um, Oracle Healthcare, which was formerly Cerner. Um, they all have great growth opportunities if you want to go down that path. And I think that that was kind of leading to where I was headed with opportunities for promotion. Um, I've heard also, um, is it true that sometimes that that unpaid help or that internship um, is a bit of a um, trial period for the employer also to get to know those students and those young people um, to see kind of what what they're made of and and how that might work in a paid position. Yeah, I actually um, my personal assistant and who also helps manage the store for me. She was our Northland Caps intern. Um, she worked for the city and chamber. And I took her out to lunch one day um, during her internship. And I said, you know, if you never ever need anything, let me know, throw my name as a reference or, or whatever. And she called me and said, hey, I'm working at um, hy V. I'm tired of doing that. I really want to start getting into my career. Do you, can I come work at your bike shop? And I said, well, I don't know if you that's what you want to do in your life. But if you want to go into government service, you can be my assistant and uh, just take on the random things that I uh, throw at you. Um, and she's worked for me for over a year now. So, um, and she's been given raises and more responsibility and she's still going to school. So um, internships are valuable. And unfortunately the pandemic's kind of uh, stopped some of those because you just can't get people to be in and out. And, and um, But they are valuable. And I, I put a lot of value into those um, to find good people. Uh, when I was at H&R uh, Block, we started an internship program with the, the college. Um, and did some consultant to hire type work as well. Our, our onboarding timeline is probably about six months to get someone up to speed. So to your point about having an intern or anything, um, you know, anything that helps get exposure and get that person the next step and like, hey, I understand the tools or I understand even the basic concepts of like ticketing and that request process and, and logging my time and just kind of keeping an idea of what I'm doing. Um, gets them that much farther down the road of, of being able to be a more valuable person. Um, I mean, when I'm looking at resumes, a person that has any of that base experience um, is, a, is a jump ahead. Um, I guess I will say with the one piece on that, there are some, some very templated, like everybody at H&R Block has the same blurb on their resume. Um, there are some pieces like that that kind of devalue the, the experience. Um, so um, that, I guess that's the one thing I will say for that. But anything that you can, you can do to get the experience, and again, anyway, um, but understanding that it may not be the most desirable. You know, pre-COVID, I could have argued, you know, hey, maybe you're not going to make as much if you worked at Walmart or McDonald's or some of those doing these types of roles but that's your entry into the field. Um, obviously with COVID, that's kind of changed the pay structure a little bit, but um, I guess that's it. So John, I want to touch back on something um, that you had mentioned earlier about working for school districts. Uh -huh. um, we've had different interviews with um, individuals that um, have built their um, IT career as part of the school district. And in working in higher ed, I've gotten to know colleagues um, in that aspect. And um, I think one major thing that I learned, and I would love for you to, to provide some examples if you, if you can think of any, is those downtimes. So we're coming off of a three-day weekend in 
in education, right? Most of our schools were out of session yesterday um, or winter break, you know, winter break just concluded not long ago. So what are some things that the, the IT professionals um, in the school districts are doing that maybe the students can volunteer in their non-school times um, to participate in? So, I mean, our district, um, we, we had the benefit of being three buildings on a campus that was literally side to side. Um, but we had, you know, any of those free times like that, when you didn't have students in a lab or students in the classrooms, was the times that those refresh projects happened. Um, I remember over, I think it was even Christmas break one year, we, we had a big shipment of machines that came in and we were, we were staging them literally on the stage um, of the theater and had an assembly line process going. And we set up like 250 some machines um, in like a four day week um, to get new computers into classrooms over the Christmas break. Um, you know, I've done some consulting with, with rockers here in town and, you know, those environments, nights, weekends, holidays, those are the times when that stuff gets worked on. Um, and it, again, it's, it's, hey, we're putting a new wireless this weekend. We're doing, you know, hey, we're recabling this room. I mean, if you look at any computer lab across America, I feel like you're going to see that rat's nest of cabling. And, you know, there's, there's never a way to make a computer lab look nice. You know, those are the projects that get done when they can get torn apart. And it's like, hey, we need to refresh these or, or um, you know, it, sadly anymore, the computer labs, even on the hardware side are getting, you know, the, the things that we would see people do to computers um, and the things that made it into CD-ROM drives, for example, that you would have never expected to be a thing. Um, it teaches you a lot about hardware diagnostics and 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 those types of things. And there's always those projects. I mean, I think any com any school computer department is going to have this graveyard of equipment over here that that you know could be resurrected if somebody had the time to take the monitor off of this and put it with this. Um, and I think there's there's again there's lots of opportunity there to get to exposure into the field. So as we're closing in on the last couple minutes here, um, is there anything that you would like to share um, in, in regards to the IT career space? Any advice or, or final tips? I, I, again, I think the biggest thing is if you have the natural desire to do it, come up with any way you can to get into the field. Um, you know, we're, we're suffering from um, kind of the certification education combobulation thing um, and the skill set skill set gap right now of, you know, finding people that want to be in the space that really want to be in the space. Um, again, there's radio ads that certain certification people run in town of you were a plumber yesterday and you can be an IT guy in six months. Um, you know, there's a difference of the people that go through that program versus the people that want to do it. Um, and I think that's, if you've got any inkling at all, explore the field, there's a thousand different things you can do, um, and, and go for it. And, and I guess the last piece I will say is, um, make yourself stand out during resumes and interviews and that type of stuff. Um, we were talking about it earlier, the number of applicants that we're getting has dramatically dropped, but it, think of, think of resume review like Tinder. Um, you know, we get five, you get 15 seconds to make yourself stand out on a resume. Um, and that's a cover letter. That's an intro paragraph that looks like you maybe read the job description. Um, it's those types of things that make a difference. I mean, I will say probably 70% of my hires have ended up having cover letters versus those that didn't. I mean, it's simple stuff. Um, but when you're going through those resumes, it's again, showing an indication that you care and are interested um, makes a dramatic difference. Yeah, and, and for me, kind of echo what John mentioned there. Um, team fit is more important to me than uh, anything else you can bring to the table. It, I On every uh, applicant that we're looking at, I do a screening call that I've set up for a, a short period of time. And you pretty much have your elevator speech to uh, get past that screening call. I don't want to waste my technical resources time to interview you. Uh, you might be the best technical question answer in the world, but if you have this entitlement that you 
should get paid this much money and you should have this job because you went and did this certification. John and I grew up when IT was not popular. We were uh, the outcasts and those that were the, the, ner- the typical nerd that had to go work on a computer. And like John said, they're advertising that you can come into this field now by passing a test. And I will hire a plumber any day of the week that's got really good troubleshooting skills and is a great team player. But if they come in and say, I should make $100,000 a year because that's what the radio ad told me and you need to give me a job because I passed this certification, I say thank you for your time. Have a great day. HR will be in contact with you, which means they're done with the interview. It's a very short process and attitude is everything because you're going to have to work with the team. You're going to have to be part of a team no matter what job you have. If you're not a good team player, try to be an entrepreneur and get somebody uh, to give you money or be a customer. Uh, You'll learn there too. You have to work with the team and be flexible. So um, there is no job that you can do on your own out there. That is very true. Very, very true. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists and for Courtney for helping us through those questions. Um, I just a quick reminder, if you could take a minute or two to complete the survey, it's going to pop up on your screen at the end of the session. Um, This will help us to bring you more helpful and relevant content. For more information on educational programs or career opportunities related to the industries discussed today, please visit us at www.edu.org. NebaWorksKC.org. That's www.nebaworkskc.org. And be sure to register for future Career Speaker Series events. And thank you again to our speakers, and we hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day.